Hatchet, Chapter 7. Mother! He screamed it, and he could not be sure if the scream awakened him or the pain in his stomach. His whole stomach tore with great rolling joints of pain, pain that doubled him in the darkness of the little shelter, put him over and face down in the sand to moan again and again. Mother, 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 never anything like this, never. It was as if all the berries, all the pits had exploded in the center of his body, ripped him, tore him apart. He crawled out of the doorway and he was sick in the sand. Then he crawled and still further and he was sick again, vomiting and with terrible diarrhea for over an hour. For over a year, he thought, until he was at least empty and drained of all his strength. Then he crawled back in his shelter and he fell again in the sand, but he couldn't sleep at first. He couldn't do anything except lay there, and his mind decided that he then to bring the memory up again. In the mall, every detail, his mother sitting in the station wagon with the man, and she had learned, leaned across and kissed him, kissed the man with short blonde hair. And it was not a friendly peck, but a kiss. A kiss where she turned her head over at the angle and she, and she put her mouth against his mouth, the mouth of the blonde man who was not his father, and kissed him mouth to mouth, and then brought her hand up to touch his cheek, his forehead, while they were still kissing. And Brian saw it. He saw the thing that his mother did with the blonde man. He saw the kiss that became the secret that his father still didn't know about, but he knew all about. The memory was so real that he could feel the heat in the mall that day. He could remember the worry that Terry would turn and see his mother, could remember the worry and the shame of all of it, and then his memory faded and he slept again, awake. For a second, perhaps two, he didn't know where he was. He was still in his sleep somewhere. Then he saw the sun streaming in the open doorway of his shelter, and he heard the close, vicious whine of all the mosquitoes, and he knew. He brushed his face, completely welted by now, with two days worth of mosquito bites, completely covered with lumps and bites, and it was surprised to find the swelling on his forehead had gone down a great deal. It was almost gone. The smell was awful, and he couldn't place it. Then he saw the pile of berries on the back of the shelter, and he remembered the night and being sick. Too many of them, he said. Too many gut cherries. He crawled out of the shelter, and he found where he'd messed in the sand. He used sticks, and he cleaned it the best he could. He covered it with clean sand, and he went down to the lake to wash his hands up and get a drink. It was still really early, only past true dawn, and the water was so calm that he could see his reflection. It frightened him. His face was cut and bleeding, swollen and lumpy. His hair was all matted and dirty. And on his forehead, he had a cut that had healed but left hair stuck with blood and a big scab. His eyes were slits in the bites that with he somehow was covered in dirt. He slapped the water with his hand to destroy the mirror. Ugly, he thought. Very, very ugly. And he was, at that moment, almost overcome with self-pity. He was dirty, starving, and bitten, and hurt and lonely and ugly and afraid, and so completely miserable that he was like being in a pit, a dark, deep pit with no way out. He sat on the bank and he fought crying. Then let it come, and he cried for perhaps three or four minutes, long, deep tears, self-pity tears, wasted tears. He stood, went back to the water, and took small drinks. As soon as the cold water hit his stomach, he felt the hunger sharpen, as it had before. And he stood and he held his abdomen until the hunger cramps receded. He had to eat. He was weak again, drowning in his own hunger. He had to eat something. Back at the shelter, the berries lay in a pile, where he dumped them. He grabbed his windbreaker. Gut cherries, he called them in his mind now, and he thought of eating some of them. Not such a crazy amount, though, as he had, which he felt brought it on the sickness in the night, but just enough to stave off his hunger a bit. He crawled into the shelter, some flies were on the berries, and he brushed them off. He selected only the berries that were solidly ripe, not the light red ones, but the berries that were dark, maroon, red to black, with swollen ripeness, which he had a small handful of them, and he went back down to the lake, and he washed them off in some water. Small fish scattered away when he splashed the water up, and he wished that he had a fishing line and a hook. And then he ate them carefully, spitting out the pits. They were still tart, but had a sweetness to them, although they seemed to make his lips a bit numb. When he finished, he was still hungry, but the edge was gone, 
and his legs didn't feel as weak as they had. He went back to the shelter. It took him an, a half an hour to go through the rest of the berries and sort them, putting all the fully ripe ones in a pile on some leaves and the rest in another pile. When he was done, he was covered. He covered the two piles with grass that he tore from the lake shore to keep the flies off, and he went back outside. They were awful berries, those gut cherries, he thought, but there was food there. Food of some kind, and he could, bit a bit, he could eat a bit more later tonight if he had to. For now, he had a full day ahead of him. He looked at the sky through the trees, and he saw that while there were clouds, they were scattered, and they didn't seem to hold any rain. There was a light breeze, and it seemed to keep the mosquitoes down, and he thought, looking up along the shore, that if there was one kind of berry, there should be other kinds, sweeter kinds, maybe kinds that wouldn't make his stomach so upset. If he kept to the lake in sight, as he had done yesterday, he should be all right. He should be able to find home again, and it stopped him. He had actually thought of it that time, home. Three days? No, two? Or was it three? Yeah, today was the third day since his plane crashed, and he thought of his shelter as his home. He turned and he looked at it, studied the outside work. The brush made a fair wall, not weather tight, but it cut most of the wind off. He hadn't done so badly. Maybe it wasn't much. Maybe it was all that he had for a home. All right, he thought. I'll call it home. He turned back and set off up the side of the lake. Heading for the gut cherry bushes, his windbreaker in his hand. Things were bad, he thought, but maybe not that bad. Maybe he would find some better berries. When he came to the gut cherry bushes, he paused. The branches were empty of birds, but still had many berries. And some of those had been merely red yesterday and were now dark maroon to black, much riper. Maybe, maybe he should stay and pick them and save them. But the explosion in the night was still such a memory that he decided to go on. Gut cherries were food, but they were tricky to eat. He needed something a little better. Another hundred yards off the shore, there was a place where the wind had torn up another apart. These must have been fierce winds, he thought, to tear up places like this. And they had the path he had found with the plane when he had crashed. Here, the trees were not all dead, way down, but the twisted and snapped off halfway from the ground. So their tops were all down and rotted and gone leaving all the snags poking out in the sky like broken teeth. It made for tons of dead and dry wood, and he wished that once more he could get a fire going. It also made for kind of a clearing. With the tops of the trees gone, the sun could get down on the ground, and it was filled with small thorny bushes that were covered in berries. New berries. Different berries. Raspberries. These he knew. Because there were some raspberry bushes in the park near his house, and he and Terry were always picking and eating them when they biked past. The berries were full and ripe, and, they t and he tasted one and found it sweet, and none of the problems of the gut cherries. Although they didn't grow in clusters, there were many of them, and they were easy to pick. And Brian smiled and started eating. Sweet juice, he thought. Oh, they were sweet, with just a ting, tiny tang. And he picked and he ate and he picked and he ate and he thought that he had never tasted anything this good. Soon, as before, his stomach was full. But now he had some sense. And he didn't need to gorge himself or cram more berries down. Instead, he picked more, put them in his windbreaker, feeling the morning sun on his back and thinking that he was rich. Rich with food now. Just rich. And he heard a noise behind him. A slight noise and he turned around to see a bear. He couldn't do anything, could think nothing. His tongue stained in berry juice stuck to the roof of his mouth, and he stared at the bear. It was black, with cinnamon-colored nose, not twenty feet from him, and big, no, huge. It was all black fur and huge. He had seen one in the zoo in the city once, a black bear, but it was from India or somewhere. This one was wild and much bigger and than the one in the zoo, and it was right there, right there. The sun caught the ends of the hairs out along his back, shining black and silky. The bear stood on its hind legs, half up, and studied Brian. It just studied him, then lowered itself and moved slowly to the left, eating berries as it rolled along, woofing and delicately using its mouth to lift up each berry from the dye stem. And in seconds, it was gone. Gone. Set And Brian still hadn't moved. His tongue was stuck to the top of his mouth. The tip half out. His eyes were wide and his hands were reaching for a berry. 
Then he made a sound of mm g. There was no sense. It was just a sound of fear, disbelief, that something that large could have come so close to him without him knowing. It just walked up to him, and it could have eaten him. It could have done anything. But it didn't. It did nothing. And when the sound was half done, a thing happened with his legs, a thing that he had nothing to do with, and they were running in the opposite direction of the bear back toward the shelter. He would have run all the way in panic, but after he had gone perhaps 50 yards, his brain took over and slowed himself down, finally stopped him. If the bear had wanted you, he said, he would have taken you. It is, a, it is something to understand, he thought, not something to run away from. The bear was eating berries not people. The bear made no move to hurt you, to threaten you. It stood near, it stood to see you better, study you, and then went on eating its berries. It was a big bear, but it did not want you. It did not want to cause you harm. And that is the thing to understand here. He turned and looked back at the stand of raspberries. The bear was gone. The birds were singing. He saw nothing that could hurt him. There was no danger here that he could sense, that he could feel. In the city at night, there was sometimes danger. You shouldn't be in the park at night after dark because of the danger. But here, the bear had looked at him and had moved on. And this filled his thoughts. But the berries were still so good. So good. So good. So sweet and rich that his body was so empty. And the bear had almost indicated that he didn't mind sharing. He just, he just walked away from him. And the berries were so good. And he thought finally... If he did not go back and get the berries, he would have to eat gut cherries again tonight. And that convinced him as he walked slowly back to the raspberry patch and continued picking for the entire morning, although with great caution. And once, when a squirrel rustled some pine needles at the base of a tree, he nearly jumped out of his skin. About noon, the sun was straight overhead. The clouds began to thicken and look dark. In moments, it started to rain, and he took what he had picked and trotted back to the shelter. He had eaten probably two pounds of raspberries and had maybe another three pounds in his jacket rolled in a pouch. He made it to the shelter just as the clouds completely opened and rain roared down in sheets. Soon, the sand outside was drenched and there were rivets running down to the lake, but inside he was dry and snug. He started to put the picked berries back in a sorted pile with the gut cherries, but he noticed that the raspberries were seeping through his jacket. They were much softer than the gut cherries and apparently being crushed a bit under their own weight. When he held the jacket up and looked beneath, he saw a stream of red liquid. He put his finger in it and he found it to be sweet and tangy, like pop without the fizz. And he grinned and he laid back on the sand, holding the bag over his face and letting the seepage drip into his mouth. Outside, the rain poured down, but Brian laid back, drinking the syrup from the berries, dry with the pain, almost all gone, the sniffness also almost gone, his belly full and a good taste in his mouth. For the first time since the crash, he was not thinking of himself. He was not thinking of his own life. Brian wondered what the bear was doing, and what, and the, if the bear was as surprised as he was to find someone else in the berries. Later in the afternoon, as evening came, he went to the lake and he washed the sticky berry juice from his face and his hands. Then he went back to prepare for the night. While he had accepted and understood that the bear did not want to hurt him, it was still much in his thoughts as the darkness came in the shelter. So he took his hatchet off his belt and he put it by his head, his hand on the handle, and the day caught up to him and he slept.